Welcome back to another episode of Trading Secrets. Today, I am not only joined, but I am in her place at the Hamptons by fashion blogger turned business mogul, New York Times bestseller, and the woman behind We Wore What? Danielle Bernstein. Danielle launched We Wore What back in 2010 to provide a daily dose of outfit inspiration, which has gone on to turn into a massive platform with over 2.9 million followers and landed her on the coveted 30 under 30 list. Over the last decade, Danielle has gone on to launch her own e-commerce store, become a New York Times bestseller, and founded We Gave What and Mo Assist. The list goes on. Today, we're gonna cover all the business ventures how she got started, where she is today, and everything in between. Danielle, thank you so much for having us out at your place in the Hamptons and being patient as we've had some technical difficulties getting up. It's so nice to meet you. I mean, can I get that intro all the time? <laughs> that was great. I like forgot about half those things. No, thank you so much for having me. This is going to be fun. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I could just follow you around the Hamptons all day and just, uh, ladies and gentlemen, here comes Danielle Bernstein, <laughs> 30 under 30, top dog. Um, My hype right. man. Your hype, your hype man. Well, <laughs> let's get into it. First, First and foremost, I'm always interested, especially creators and entrepreneurs like yourself, you obviously had to see some type of gap in what was happening in the industry. Mm -hmm. So what did you feel was missing in the fashion industry or within the segment that you're in that started the whole We Wore That project? So We Wore What actually started about 11 years ago now. And okay. it was totally a passion project. Um, I started as a street style photographer and I was okay. photographing a daily source of outfit inspiration for what should be the easiest part of our day, getting dressed in the morning. You know, it's women, sometimes the hardest. <laughs> and I wanted to provide my friends that were not in city schools with that source of outfit inspiration that I was seeing every day. And then I would take the photo, ask what they were wearing, and then go back and link it on my blog or similar items. So I started as a blogger, actually. Interesting. Um, soon then, Instagram came to be, and I turned to social media and really figured out how to start monetizing my business. And We Wore What became more about my personal style and my lifestyle. And I ended up dropping out of school wow. to pursue this full time. Yes, I had to put together a whole presentation and presented it. And this is a story in my book, actually. Presented it to my father and said, I need you to support me financially for one semester. Hmm. And if by the end of that semester I can't financially support myself, I'll go back to school. And then I ended up not going back. What year was that that you left school? That was 2012. Okay. At yeah. this point, was the business up and running in any capacity? Or did it you was. I was starting to be compensated to okay. post on my blog by brands. Okay. Um, not yet on social media, but brands like All Saints or Macy's um, started, you know, a few hundred dollars here and there. It was yeah. never, you know, the amounts it is now. And I would link to the items and they would see sales from it. And that's how I started to prove, you know, the, the power of an influencer, which influencer wasn't even the term we were using at the time. I was still a blogger uh -huh. and then re really started to define what it meant to be an influencer and how to monetize that. So when you did, you, did you go back to school or no? No. Okay. So when you I'm didn't waiting go back for my honorary degree from FIT, they told me it was coming eventually. So. <laughs> there you go. Box we'll checked. See. I go back and speak there all the time. So. That is so cool. I mean, what a full circle you mm -hmm. leave and then you get the honorary degree and now you're speaking there. Um, but I'm curious, did your dad follow up with you? Did he make you show him the oh, financials for sure. of the success? And, and, and I eventually was essentially cut off. So I was fully financially independent at the age of 20. Wow. And so were you using the funds then from influencing as capital to drive the business? Exactly. So I was reinvesting everything I was making back into We Wore What in order okay. to grow it. Gotcha. Whether that meant, you know, getting new clothing or investing in new equipment or um, a new place or f f photography. Uh, yeah. Okay. And so for We Wore What, did you have to do any type of fundraising at all or did you own the company and own the company outright yourself? Nope own the company. Damn, that's impressive. Almost everyone we've had on to a certain level has had to use other people's money, OPM at some point, and you did it yourself. All right, everyone right now, this is, by the way, 2010, 2012 for everyone mm -hmm. listening. Right now, 2022, everybody is trying to grow their social media, right? Yeah. Everyone's an influencer. Everyone's trying to do what you did 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. So those who are listening that are, have their small business or they want to create something, what do you attribute to like the mass growth you've had? Because if you look at the growth, 2.9 million followers, mm -hmm. I read an article in Gotham that you had 2.6 million followers last July. So that's 300,000 growth. Mm -hmm. 
I'm no, about to be no at three million, getting, by the way. Okay, about to like crack into three. Like twenty five thousand away. Okay, yeah. twenty five thousand away. Yeah. But no one, and no, it's rare that companies, especially small startups, are growing at that rate. What do you attribute to it? But you know what? So I'll I'll tell you first what I attribute the growth to. But also I want to stress how less important those numbers are now. Okay. So my growth is totally organic. I've been doing this for ten plus years. I organically grew every single year. I always stayed as corny as it is, totally true to my style, my aesthetic, my lifestyle. I shared very transparently all the time. I was actually one of the first influencers slash bloggers to publicly talk about how we make money on Instagram. And Harper's Bazaar did a big article about it that ended up getting picked up by The Post and um, CNN and like all these other platforms about how influencers are actually monetizing their businesses. Mm -hmm. And it was kind of a hush hush thing before that. Like nobody really spoke about, can you really get $10,000 for a post? Sure. And what that meant and what that looked like. So I've always been really transparent in talking about the business side of being an influencer because yes, I'm a creative person, but I really am more business minded first. Okay. Um, And then, you know, nowadays I look at like my brand's channel has 300,000 followers versus my 3 million. It's so much more important now to have really a really engaged audience that's actually dedicated, that's actually shopping versus trying to just continue to grow your numbers. Because even though as an influencer, those numbers look good to a brand, all of these brands are really looking for an ROI. So they want to see that your followers are engaged. And even if that's 100,000 followers, if you have a high engagement rate, that means you're going to sell a product. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I have a, based on what you just said, I have a million questions because one of the things mm-hmm. that started this podcast was exactly that. Get off the bachelorette, build this smaller platform, and I'm getting paid X, Y, and Z, you know, like 10K to do a story. Yeah. And, and my buddies are ripping on me. They're like, oh, sweet, tap that, like that, swipe up. And I'm like, and you're like, I have made let me a show you. Let, 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 let me tell you what I just made in 45 seconds. Then they're interested. Yes. And I remember in 2018 when I started, people were like, this is a joke. Now it's a lot more transparent. So when was it that you started talking about these numbers behind the scenes of social I media? I think, well, so you mentioned Forbes 30 under 30, which happened for me at 24 years old. Crazy. And that was a major career goal of mine. I wanted to be on the list before I turned 25, Damn. which is a lofty goal for a 24 totally. year old. But you know, in that interview process, I had to show my income, like what I was making, how I was monetizing my business and what my future plans were. And they obviously saw that as a reason to be on the list. And so I have always been really transparent in talking about you know, when I'm making money versus when I'm posting something unsponsored and, and how much you can really be making by doing this. But what's most important for other influencers to do is really to own their own product eventually. As you know, now you have your podcast, you sure. own that. Like you're sure. not just like, getting paid on sponsorships. Right. So for me, that was creating Shop We Were What, my brand, and being able to sell my own product versus everyone else's and really put the proof in my own pudding. Yeah, that makes so much sense. Real quick, Forbes 30 under 30, we've had this discussion and we've had a lot of questions and we don't know the answers. A lot of people have speculation that people like will pay to get on those lists. Can you, you do that? I, apparently, people <laughs> I, will talk not about from that. What I know. But I, th- that's all news to me. The fact that they'll like yeah. interview you and they'll want to know your income, and so it gets that in depth. Like that's oh, yeah. that's new well, news to, to this be podcast. You have to nominated by somebody else first. So okay. uh, my agent at the time nominated me. Got it. And then there's a like lengthy interview process, and they look into your financials, and it, there's a lot more to it. Rumors cracked everybody. It's a whole different story than people were thinking. Yeah, you can't pay to be Someone on that list. Was, That's like also like people speculated that you can pay to be on the New York Times bestseller list. Yes, yeah, but yeah, But we yeah. sold 30,000 books in... You, so the way you get on the New York Times bestseller list is you have to sell a certain amount of books in a certain amount of time. Yep. And we sold 30,000 books in like the, the first, first two, week, first right? week first or whatever week, yeah. it was, like week or two. That's what gets you on the list. Totally, yeah. So people were like, you can't buy your own book on Amazon 5,000 times. It's like the <laughs> no. craziest thing I've ever heard of. Yeah, we have we have busted that myth here. We talked all about oh, the have. bulk buying, the New York Times. We got into it with Claudia, so many, and we got into the publishers, so we yeah. busted that one. This is the first time we're busting the Forbes 30 under 30 list uh it's good to know that that's the due diligence they do and that's how like detailed i I don't know how it is now like granted this is a while ago but fully was a like legitimate process i love it all right back to brand deals real quick how when you go through the process especially early on when you're using that capital Mm -hmm. to invest back into we were what how did you decide what deals were were for you how'd you negotiate them and and for people that don't have a clue where do these deals even come from Yeah, so I think that 
one of the hardest parts about my career early on was really learning when to say no. And that's all in an effort to stay true to my aesthetic and my brand and to not just post every teeth whitening, like gummy bear, whatever <laughs> that, that came my way, like tummy tea, like all that stuff. So that's firstly. Okay. Secondly, you know, I had uh, an agent after a few years that worked at a model management company. She started the talent division there. And then together we decided let's leave the traditional agency world and work together. Mm -hmm. And she was going to work with three of us and really take these incoming deals that were just coming into my email and actually be proactive and go out to brands that we think we can be really effective with and partner with, whether it's a nail company or hair company or an alcohol company. Sure, so sure. Um, we started out doing outreach for brands and proposing different types of partnerships and okay. just building those relationships. That's awesome. One of the things you talk about is aesthetic on your page. And so if you guys haven't seen the Instagram page, go check it out like immediately. We wore what? <laughs> it is, I think it's like the tightest aesthetic I've ever seen. Like, really? Oh my, it's unbelievable. And one of the things I was thinking about was for someone that's looking into that and trying to you know, capture an aesthetic, mm -hmm. how long and like how many pictures and what's the planning process of, of getting your page to look as clean and cut as it does? You know what I think actually gives my page its aesthetic is that it is so organic. None of it is planned. It's 15 seconds of taking maybe like 50 pictures while I'm getting into a car to go to a meeting and it's all shot on an iPhone, street style focused, like in the span of me walking from my apartment to my office, which is less than three blocks, yeah. take filters as I walk and that's it. And if I get the shot, I get the shot. And if I don't, I don't post that day. That's great. Those and aren't pre-planned shoots. They're, none of them are pre-planned except for the brand photo shoots, which are lookbooks and campaign shoots that we plan ahead of time. But okay. everything on my personal Instagram account is what happens that day. Gotcha. And that is not the case for probably 90% of the influencer industry. So I think what sets me apart and what has helped me maintain a loyal following over the years is people feel like, and you know, from being on a reality show, mm -hmm. That they're watching a reality show and they're yep. watching my career and they're following my Instagram, whether it's my stories, which are always in real time, totally. except for if I'm somewhere public and I need to post a little bit after yeah. because I don't want people to show up. <laughs> But everything is happening that day. So I'm never that. posting three days later for something that happened three days ago. Gotcha. I'm always okay. posting in real time. And I think that like that reality show kind of like, oh, that's what she wore today. There it is in her feed. There it is in her stories. I see how she walks in it. I see how it is. I'm going to go buy that item. That's so true. Because everything right now is so manicured too, right? There's so it's much editing manicured. and all yeah. this that people will capture all this content. And then a month later, they'll put mm -hmm. it up. And then they try and put something in real time. And there is no organic approach. That type of stuff just doesn't feel feel good for me yeah. if it's not happening in real time and I can't speak to it in a way that feels authentic it just doesn't feel good and if for I don't sure. put it out there in a way that feels good my followers know that totally totally get that now we're talking from a creator perspective now I want to talk from a business perspective I see that you sit on the board uh, from an advising perspective on Wellbell and Highline Wellness I actually know uh, Brendan who owns Highline Wellness and yeah. I just did a few deals with Highline Wellness so they're great they're great the pro I mean I took it last night they have these melatonin gummies that Best taste CBD oil out there oh it's yeah. fire I mean, I slept, slept like a king last night, yeah. but question from an advisory perspective, when you mm -hmm. sit on a board like that, what entices you to do so? And when you see their financials and like their growth, what are some takeaways you have mm -hmm. from the overall influencing market? Cause these are direct to consumer products that are driven by social media. Exactly. So my strategic investments and advisor positions, which there's a, a few more than what we named okay. have all come about from very organic relationships. So Highline Wellness, for example, they um, hired me to do three months worth of content for them. Okay. And after like a month and a half, I stopped and I said, I think I could really be instrumental. I see the growth and the potential in the company. I got to know the founders really well. You need a full rebranding, a new digital marketing strategy, and I'm going to help you do that. So wow. I came on and switched my payment to advisor shares and, you know, sacrificed that so that I could become an advisor for them. I helped them with a full rebranding, digital marketing strategy, strategic introductions to more investors and 
really came on and helped them completely change their business model. That is unbelievable. I mean, I think there's a lot of takeaways for anyone listening there too, right? Like company comes to client and client rethinks how they're doing it and then repositions themselves mm-hmm. to benefit and different ways. So rather than taking yeah. cash for collaboration, you are then getting shares of the company. Exactly. And that's it's brilliant. Listen, those are rare occasions when yeah. you really truly believe in a company and its growth and you know that the value of those shares are more valuable than getting paid for sponsored content. Um, but those situations I call marrying a brand and you really like marry the company and you become exclusive in that category to them. And I did that with Wellbell, the hair supplement company yeah. that I own a large percentage of. I had been using it for close to two years now, but at the time when I came on board, it was given to me by my doctor who mm-hmm. has three sisters and it's basically a better version of Nutrafol. And I'll Gosh, say that all day. Anyway. <laughs> you heard it's it. a hair growth company. You're sitting here. You can look at my hair right now. It's insane. I had <laughs> not great hair for a very long time. I had extensions. It was fried. And I started using this product because my doctor made it for his sisters. Okay. He had three sisters at the time and he's like this really cool concierge doctor. He made it. He gave it to me in a little white bottle and I started using it. And a year later, I was like, holy shit, this works. We need to brand this. We need to make this a company. So I took ownership in it, helped them do the same thing I did with Highline Wellness, full okay. rebranding, like became basically the face of it. Yeah. And it's going to do close to $10 million this year. Damn. All right. Tons of questions. This is off yeah. the script here. But one <laughs> thing I'll tell you guys is when I got into, it's just talking to Danielle before the show and we're talking about this person and this person, and this person, all oh, your friends with this person, you know, everybody. And not only do you know everybody, but <laughs> I'm, I'm, a seeing, social butterfly. But I'm seeing the way you network too in the brands that end up coming to you. So I got to ask, or at least if if you can give a tip to the listeners, networking can be a pain in the ass. Oh, it could be awful. Yeah. But what what is like your, I was going to say, a trading secret to networking because you yeah, do it so well. Yeah, I, I mean, I've always been a fearless networker. And that comes in so many different forms from a firm handshake to a, you know, let me get your email and following up right away the next morning and, and going up to anybody that I would never, I was never too scared to go up to the you know, most important person in the room and introduce Hmm. myself as if I was also that important. And just having that sort of inner confidence that it it comes off to the people that you're around as like, oh, I should give this person the time of day. If they are that confident, they obviously have something to say. Um, But I always was very fearless in following up relentlessly until I could get a meeting and and get face to face with the people I wanted to meet and network with. I love that. But how about a tip to, because a lot of people really struggle with that first I'm going to go up to him. I see that person. I know I need to talk to he or she. Have a drink first. What do you, but do you, okay, so fire <laughs> a down a drink. Color but courage. what's your, what is like, do you have like yeah. a, an intro line you use? Do you just literally go up and say, so hey, I, I just I want always, to introduce myself? So actually in in the past, I always looked the person up ahead of time and and did a little research and found some, some, found some common ground to have with them. So whether they grew up in the same town as me or I knew somebody that was from a previous company that they owned and had a reason and something to say that showed interest in what they were doing or their history, I which that. I think is really important. So just like going up for a handshake, hi, I'm Danielle Bernstein, lovely to meet you. Like, I love what you did this, or oh, you're from Great Neck, me too. Or do you know Perfect. this person from here? I think we have that in common. And there just it is. Just gotta do your research. Yeah. Some type There's of due no, diligence. There's no like, yeah, due diligence. Due I diligence. Would say. And like, I, th- I think the idea of like, make it, it's not like a cold, hello, like I'm a, I'm a threat. It's, hey, yeah, I saw you went here, you did this. I love that it's article awesome. you wrote in there, that, yeah. that speaking thing you did there. That's good stuff. I like it. All Show right. interest. So from creator to networking queen to also on the boards and investor, mm. you, you also have a tech company. The mm-hmm. list doesn't end. So uh, <laughs> Mo Assist, yes. uh, an influence, uh, influencer management tool. Yes. Uh, everything from creating, right, planning, invoicing, etc. When did you launch that? And has this tech company grown in the same facet that the whole influencer industry has grown? Great questions. Um, so Mo Assist launched as really the first project management tool for the influencer industry, okay. really with the goal of putting the power back in the influencer's hand and Moasis as a company is based on Mo, who's sitting there on Zoom behind us, who is my nine-year interned assistant turned COO and basically runs the company alongside me. That's awesome. Um, and it's based on putting her job into a platform, which she's been instrumental in helping We Were What grow. And we launched during the pandemic, mm-hmm. um, which was probably not a great launch time. Mm-hmm. And we launched with a beta version to learn. Okay. Tech companies are so different. They yeah. are so much of a slower process. And I went into it knowing that. So there hasn't been any sort of like 
disappointment. It's been, let's learn in this beta version and then let's pause and redevelop. So okay. actually for the past year, we've been redeveloping the platform and are going to be relaunching it late September. Gotcha. And, and if, you know, based on learnings, you know, what does it need to focus on? We need an agency version of it. That's not just for the influencers, like two different ways to get into the platform mm -hmm. um, and a lot of new features that I think are just more relevant now. Interesting. One thing to think about, I'm just throwing a tip out there. Okay. So Evan and I, we own a talent management company together. Oh, and we will talk about we Moses will then. talk because yes. first of all I think it'd be a great product for a lot of the talent we rep but additionally the way that deals come to influencers is all over the board and it's, it's so yeah. sporadic and it's inconsistent if there was an app that also sourced deals or they could, or like an influencer could put bids out like yeah. I'm trying to acquire but there this are type a of lot brand. of marketplaces out mm. there that do that and they are very spread out yeah so like Instagram for example now released a tool where you can put an offer out to talent. Sure. But where do you manage all of that? Because it's never, there's never going to be one place where that happens, right? There's right. so many agencies, so many marketplaces, so many places where deals are coming in from all different angles. Yeah. But where do you manage all of it? Like we use a notepad or a Google spreadsheet. That's where Mo comes in is that all those deals go to one place and then Got you can it. manage, set your deliverables through that, send them to the client through that. And it's a one-stop shop. Brilliant. Evan, put it on the calendar. We're going to talk about that. You guys that. will do our beta testing for the new We'll product. do some beta testing. <laughs> but for anyone that is listening that might be an influencer in the space in any capacity, mm -hmm. what's the price point and where can they get it when it comes out? So we're going to be relaunching with a whole new price point okay. and a whole new platform. So late September, you'll hear more about it. Late September. Check it out. That's another, Thank you. another place that you're in. It's wild. Okay. <laughs> of all the different businesses you have, you said you're an investor. You have the fashion business. You have the tech business. You have a New York Times bestseller. Which of them has been the most lucrative for you? My brand. Okay. By, By far. a long shot. Yeah. Shop We Wore What, which is my brand that started off as Swim, is now Swim, Activewear, Ready to Wear, Intimates, soon to be three more categories next year, and really just like taking over. Um, it's an amazing price point with quality product and we really focus on giving our customers what they ask for. Mm -hmm. So I have a unique position where I have such a direct line of communication with our customers. So I'm constantly including them in the process and getting their feedback along the way. So whether that's colorways or fits or fabrics, they're included in the process and thus we see it in the sales. Got it. I anticipated that because I had my team do a little uh, due diligence with Mo and they had said that in your first swim collection that you had made nearly $2 million in the first 12 hours of launching. Are those numbers true? That was, yeah, th it was actually with wholesale it was closer to 3 million. Damn. And that was our first swim collection, which was Italy themed. Okay. And it was a, actually a collaboration still at that point with Onya, who's my business partner in the brand now. Okay. And uh, since then we have continued to grow these collections and, and launch new categories. When you forecasted that, did you have the inventory and did you project to do 3 million in sales in 12 hours or was that a shock to you? No, it was supposed to be over a longer period of time for sure. We did Damn. not expect it to do that well in one day. That's unbelievable. Well, hats off to you. Thank you. Now, where do you see most of the success, wholesale or direct to consumer? Direct to consumer. So we're about 60, almost 70% direct to consumer and 40, 30% wholesale. Okay. And now that you know the influencer market better than most and even have products and tools for influencers. Are, is is the company actually? Are you? Do you guys hire influencers? Like, are you in we the, do, the yeah. job now so of hiring what you once were? We do, and it's very interesting because I'm even more like critical on the influencers that we work with because I know your capacity and what your engagements should be, and if you perform well and if you deliver, basically the way I would deliver for a brand. So, you know, I even get to work with influencers that send me like many pieces of content like over what their contract says they should and then I also work with influencers that don't really deliver and I expect mm. to do better than they do and their links don't provide sales so I'm I'm learning as a brand owner even more about my industry now interesting and when you're looking to hire someone what is the number one thing you're looking for when you're looking to deploy money to help drive your brand it depends what for so okay. we hire for two things we hire for conversion to sales and an ROI we also hire for UGC for user or generated content that is just aesthetically pleasing that we need for our social media. Got so we it. do two things and the UGC content, we don't expect anything in return except for great photos for the okay. other content. We expect sales. Interesting. Okay. Well, I mean with your eye for the marketing and the creative, I'm surprised you have yet to start a marketing agency or a media agency. That's like agency. a whole other, <laughs> although we do have such a 
badass graphic design team and you know our team is so strong and they they hustle like crazy so mm -hmm. i could see that for us one day but they're very busy doing the marketing for my brand that yeah. i don't even know how we could take on others S sounds like your plate's full but if yeah. you need more it does that seem could like be an the option next that could be the venture. next one and we talked about it here first i want a piece of, of that pie <laughs> um when you're looking so you talked about highline wellness that you wanted to take on shares mm -hmm. you talked about the fact you have other early seed type investments when you're looking to invest in a company that's within an industry outside of what you know and what you work in what are things you're thinking about before you want any type of equity in a company? Um, I mean, I definitely like review their financial decks and their and their investor decks and the plans for their for their future business. But I also look to see that I can be instrumental in helping them grow. Okay. Um, so you know, I'm an investor in an alcohol brand, a, uh, a tequila brand, a wine brand, uh, a food, two food brands, and really just looking to see that a I love the product, mm -hmm. I have to love it and use it, yeah. and that b I can be helpful in some way, whether that's on the back end or the front end of the of the brand. Got it. That makes sense. So using whatever type of equity you can bring to the brand based mm -hmm. on your skill set yeah. and knowing that that it can bring the brand to the next level. Um, that makes a lot of sense. What about we were what? Like what is the when you look at the forecast for the two, five, ten year plan? Is there a certain number you're trying to achieve from a revenue perspective or a number you're trying to exit? Or is there some bigger plan? Then all I mean, the everybody has happened. their number. So yeah. of course, um, not one I'm willing to share, but yeah. yes, everyone has a number. I, I really want to focus on the next three to five years in building out the brand into more categories, um, introducing extensions of the brand okay. and really growing our direct to consumer business more because that's the one thing we can really control, especially in this market. I mean, the supply chain issues across the world are insane it's right nuts. now. Anybody that has any sort of consumer facing company will know. And so really owning your customer and owning your product is so important and yeah. being able to get that out in the best way possible. So focusing on, you know, redoing our marketing, going from collection launches to weekly drops and just figuring out what the next like iteration of the We Were What brand is and really focusing on that plus on the influencer side, longer term partnership. So yeah. that side of my business is not as important as it used to be, but I still really value and love my longer term partnership. So one off posting, such a thing of the past, but I really look for three to six month to one year contracts. Gotcha, okay, that makes sense. When you think about the industry and things that are changing, I just know nothing about this, and I'm curious if it's on your radar at all. I saw that a lot of the big brands like the Gucci's and the Louis Vuitton's are doing like NFTs tied somehow to fashion. Mm -hmm. Like, is that something that you see Ugh, taking I, off? I can't and, even begin to try yeah, and understand that world. You're just like, it's Nor not, do I have the capacity to bring it on. I love but it. But I do think, obviously, like something in the metaverse and, and creating that you know, that aspect for any company is important. You just need to be like educated about it. And yeah. I'm, I'm quite frankly, not yet. Yeah. Um, I think there's a lot of people that are that you can bring in as consultants to help do something like that, but we don't even have retail stores yet. So Got I it. have to think about like, is do, do we need retail stores first? Do we need a store in the metaverse? Yeah. Like, where do we need to go with this? <laughs> so yeah, I mean, we're constantly communicating about it and, and keeping ourselves as up to date and educated as possible, but there's a lot to focus on right now and you really I do a lot of things at once yeah. more than most but you know have to sort of limit that and stay focused okay so metaverse on hold for right now but you yeah. do see in the future a few questions mm -hmm. I always like to ask owners for consumer protection so okay. like trading secrets you can give them so if they're if someone is in the, the market to shop for something in the fashion space what is one like tip or strategy you'd give them to consider or look for that they should be aware of that maybe they're not aware of like, like what quality mean? is there certain things you should look for from the company that you're buying for are there certain times maybe things might be on sale like are there any consumer like buying tips you'd give okay interesting yes i think i mean quality is obviously really important and we focus on quality and fit first mm -hmm. and then design and then price point follows with that because we like to keep a lower price point but I would say that yes, brands always put items on sale. It just, they're always off season if so. So okay. if you know you want a product with our brand products sell out, the best sellers will sell out on the first day. Yeah. So if you want a product, get on it and get it quickly. Actually, a really good tip for that would be there's always a discount code available. Whether you sign up for somebody's text message marketing, email marketing, you download their app, you leave a review, there's always a way to get a discount code 
for a direct to consumer business, there's 20 different ways for my business to get a discount code to shop with. And you should always be utilizing those. Okay. So I have to ask now if someone wants a discount code for we wore what, where, where's the first place to go? I would first sign up for the email marketing. You get a 20% off code right there. There you I go. mean, or text marketing, or you download the app or you leave a review. If you leave a review, you get a 20% discount code. There you go. 20% off. You guys <laughs> just got it. Um, what about a fast? But we also, we can, we count for that in our, in our business. Like we know we're going to be giving out these discount codes sure. and, and that all goes into the price. Yeah. So in general with your business and many other businesses out there, they're forecasting those discounts. Exactly. They're out there. If they're smart. It's yeah. not like you're cheating going to get those. They're there for the no, taking. We, just do what it takes exactly. to get them. Got it. All right. One fashion tip you'd give someone that you had mentioned when you started your blog, uh, some women out there don't start the day knowing exactly what they're going to mm -hmm. wear and it doesn't come easy. Mm -hmm. Do you have like a golden rule or a fashion tip you'd give, uh, for someone as they're trying to get ready for something or just the day? Um, I would say comfort is key. So for me, if I'm wearing one thing tight, there's always one thing loose with it. So if I'm wearing tight bottoms, the top is loose or a tight top, the bottoms are loose. Um, and always focusing on being comfortable because if you're not comfortable, you don't feel your best and then you definitely don't look your best. That's a good one. And is that trend changing? Cause I saw that one red carpet with Justin Bieber and he's in that like oversized suit. Is that the thing that's like trending now? Oversized not necessarily things? oversized will always be like in, in some capacity, but I still love like a very tailored look. I think it just depends on the occasion and something about me and my personal style is I wear so many different hats and my style is ever changing and I don't categorize myself as feminine or edgy or this or that. I literally could be a different style every day of the week. Gotcha. Okay. Good stuff. Good to know. These are things that I didn't <laughs> know about the industry that I am taking on and I will That's, look I mean, it's into. It's not the case for everybody. Yeah. A lot of people define themselves by their style. Yeah. As we get ready for Jill's event tomorrow, let's uh, make sure we're comfortable. One thing tight, one thing loose. I'll be thinking. Hey, yeah. um, what do you think in, in the industry from an owner's yeah. point of view? What is the biggest challenge and change happening in the fashion industry right now? I mean, I think that brands, it's risky now to be spending a lot on marketing, right? Just from where the economy is. So I think okay. brands are really looking for a return on their investment more than before. Whereas like I explained like a lot of times it's like, you know, if you work with somebody with three plus million followers, there's a combination of they're like kind of a celebrity, but they're an influencer. And are you just getting exposure? Or are you also going to see a return on your investment? And so I like to think I give you both, right? I give yeah. you the exposure, but I'm also going to sell a shit ton of product for you. Gotcha. And it's a lot riskier for brands to pay the price that it is to work with somebody as big as I am or the, or the other girls that are kind of like the OG influencers. And so I think brands are being a lot more risk adverse with their marketing dollars just because they have to be. Interesting. Yeah. And of those areas that you might spend money, I mean, it makes sense, especially with recession. I mean, mm -hmm. the, the, the need to have, the like to have buying purchases, we're seeing those slow down as the exactly. market's down 20%. And then on top of that, you're dealing with inflation, right? So you have 9% inflation. So it's you have to crazy. mark up with the time that's happening, but you also have people buying less. Exactly. It's got to be a crazy time when you look at the different social media forums that you can go for marketing, right? TikTok, LinkedIn, Instagram, Twitter, YouTube. Have you found more success in one versus the other? Is there one of those areas you're paying more attention to now? Um, we have a TikTok and my team runs it and it's totally about putting the we back in we wore what. And so it's very mm -hmm. team focused, customer focused, and that's been great to just like get the word out there. Um, but Instagram is still definitely the driver for sales. Instagram still is over mm -hmm. TikTok, mm -hmm. huh? And do, do, is true or false? People will spend more on Instagram than they will on TikTok. True, just because it's an following. older demographic, primarily. Okay, okay. I think. so they have more yeah. more purchasing power. Mm -hmm. Got it. All right. Well, let's wrap also with we heard a lot about the we, but we gave what? It's a really cool yes. uh, philanthropic thing that you have done to give back to organizations mm -hmm. that mean a lot to you. So tell tell people a little bit about what your initiatives are and how you chose the organizations you've surrounded yourself with. Yeah. So we gave what started at the beginning of the pandemic as a way to give back past the pandemic. So it started with a need and then we have continued it over two years later mm -hmm. and really we gave what plays as the middleman between all of these amazing organizations that already exist, these small businesses that don't have exposure and my platform of a larger audience and my community and my friends and their communities. And so we, we play that middleman where we raise awareness, we raise funds, we do creative initiatives, we 
bring awareness to the small businesses. We collaborate with them and we help, we have helped so many different small businesses wow. to actually be, be able to do their business full time. It's been some of the most rewarding work of my career. We've been able to give back hundreds of thousands of dollars to several different organizations that have become part of our community. And we continue to support them through each year and time and time again. And it's just been great to see like the direct impact that my community can make. And we story tell so much with the give backs that we do. So my community feels so invested in it as well. And they're able to see where their money's going. So yeah. if we're giving back a portion of proceeds from a swim launch, they're able to see exactly where that donation is going because we share that. I absolutely love that. I mean, the transparency in any type of work like that is mm -hmm. so important because you see how many, how many people out there aren't doing that. And yeah. I think just the causes you're, you're supporting, right? Sustainability, education, empowerment, health and wellness, humanitarian, equality and human rights. I mean, those are such core pillars to what is so necessary today. So yeah. to see the success you've had, to talk about the numbers, the dollars, um, the strategy, and then also full circle to how you're giving back is incredible 30 under 30 <laughs> at 24 are we going 40 under 40 under, th uh, under 35 what's do the we, next goal do we like that list <laughs> I don't even I'm kind of like over it in a sense. Um, no I mean I think I would love to write another book cool I think that's in the pipeline and then I just have really more business goals I think like I don't necessarily need the validation of more lists but yeah. they would be nice there you go. <laughs> we heard it here. All right. You got to leave us with one trading secret. So something that someone couldn't find in a textbook, learn in a classroom. It could be about financial management, money management, oh career God. management, branding, anything. You got to leave us with one trading secret. I mean, and now what do you got? just currently, I would say hire a great fucking lawyer. Interesting. Yeah. Can you give us a little more there? I just think like I have over my career and more so the past three plus years than ever have needed a great lawyer that I can contact at any time, any day of the week. And that really wants to work hard for me that mm -hmm. not is not necessarily billing every single hour sure. and isn't a cheap lawyer, but yeah. is money well spent. And there was a big portion of the early part of my career where I didn't have a lawyer look at my contracts. And I was so young, I was not even, sure. they were small few hundred dollar contracts and I didn't want to pay the exact amount that the contract was on a lawyer. And that was a huge mistake. I can't even stress enough to my other influencer friends, to anyone that owns a business, how important it is to have a great attorney, lawyer, whatever. That's a good trading secret. Stay tuned to the recap. I'll tell you how I got burned by not having a lawyer. Is there one area or like amendment of a contract you can think of that if you would have had a lawyer, it would have protected Interesting. you. For influencers, usage rights are the most huge, important. So whether huge. a brand can use your images elsewhere than just reposting on their social media, if they can use it for paid advertising and all that stuff. And then um, termination rights. Termination rights. There you go. All right. A lot of moving parts there. <laughs> I will. Uh, that could be a whole episode. I won't dig any further because that could be a whole episode. But uh, Danielle, thank you so much for coming on Trading Secrets, an investor, a founder, um, a, a philanthropist, Forbes 30 under 30, a New York Times bestseller. The list keeps going on. It will <laughs> keep going on. Thank you so much for being here on Trading thank Secrets. You. We appreciate it. This was so much fun.